of donors are uh, raising concerns about Ron DeSantis' potential run for president. The Washington Post reports that enthusiasm for the Florida governor's bid for the White House has rapidly cooled, confronting DeSantis with a considerably more difficult political outlook for the campaign he is expected to launch. The Post continues donors, activists, and other supporters are increasingly voicing worries that DeSantis has made unforced errors or embraced extreme positions that could hurt him in a general election, including the abortion ban at six weeks that he signed last week. The paper continues. He has struck some Republicans in, as distant in personal interactions. Some Republicans trace DeSantis's struggle to lock down endorsements in part to his insularity and said he should have done more to cultivate relationships. One Republican mega donor, Home Depot founder Ken Langone, tells The Post that it wouldn't hurt for DeSantis to be a little more conciliatory in his demeanor, while noting that he worries about the resurgence of former President Donald Trump, whom he previously backed but argues cannot win another general election. And, and that's a weird time and time again. He's not conciliatory to other people. We heard about uh, Congressman Stubbe, who, uh, after he got hurt, falling off yeah. the roof um, um, and in really bad shape. Ron DeSantis didn't uh, call him, didn't reach out to him. Donald Trump did immediately. Uh, there's a press conference impacting his district. The governor says, this is my press conference. You're not allowed up here, basically. Uh, all, of, all of this is it's politics 101 and Ron DeSantis is not good at politics 101. Uh, and, and, you know, Willie, this this attack on Disney, which you know I've just said is stupid from the beginning, really dumb from the start. Um, it, it it's it's gotten a lot tougher, especially we've talked about it because Bob Iger is now back at Disney, and Iger is a guy who has so much respect among all the donors, among among people on Wall Street, among among my gosh. Uh, all the people that Ron DeSantis would want to support him, uh, and and he's making a mistake. And, and <laughs> gotta say, it's pretty funny watching Iger just slowly turn up the heat on him because you're not going to beat Iger if you're Ron DeSantis. Like Meatball Ron, as Trump says, versus Bob Iger, yeah. it's not a close call. Yeah, no, that's not a fight that Governor DeSantis likely is going to win, and yet he con continues to bore down into that issue and get himself deeper in the hole on it. Bob Iger has called Governor DeSantis' position anti-business, and that is something that's been shared by many Republicans, people running against Ron DeSantis, Republicans in the Senate uh, saying that this is a crazy position to take, that it's anti-business. And it was Governor Christie, who's considering a run himself, who said, when did Republicans be the ones who got their feelings hurt about one thing and went after a private company to punish them for it? Uh, he's facing Governor DeSantis' new criticism about that ongoing battle with Disney. Here's the take of uh, Fox Business host and former advisor to Donald Trump, Larry Kudlow. I just want to observe that Governor DeSantis is close to making a fool of himself with his Walt Disney obsession. This has been going on now for months and months and months. And I would argue that it is unseemly, number one. A governor should not be come crashing down on, if not the biggest, one of the biggest business. I don't like Disney's politics either, their woke politics. My guess is Bob Iger is going to change that. But whatever. I, uh, DeSantis should make a deal and stop already. He's not running against Walt Disney for president. Join the conversation, CEO of the Messina Group, Jim Messina. He served as White House Deputy Chief of Staff to President Obama and ran his 2012 re-election campaign. Jonathan Lemire, Jen Psaki with us as well. Um, so, Jim, I'll ask you, I know you're no supporter of Ron DeSantis, but just as a keen political observer and someone who knows how to win elections, How's this going so far for Governor DeSantis? <laughs> Not very well. I mean, who has better numbers than Mickey Mouse? I mean, this is insane. Who's had more great times in their lives than people at Disney World? And you start to pick these fights, and it sounds like a good idea. You're throwing around the spitball ideas at the end of the day and throw out a press release, fine. But month after month of this, and I totally agree with Joe, Bob Iger is a very smart political and business operative, and he's just going to make DeSantis twist here. I have a theory about how to win the presidential 
presidential campaign, you have to have some magic. Mm-hmm. Barack Obama had magic. Donald Trump is the best counterpuncher we've seen. I was recently with DeSantis at a conference, and I spent a bunch of time watching him work the room. Willie, there's no magic here. I think he is one of the most overestimated politicians uh, of the recent past. And I think the national stage is starting to become hard for him. And, John, let's just take a look at his trip to Washington over the last couple of days. That is, if Jim Messina were running that operation, you have all the endorsements wired before you step foot into Washington. You go shake some hands. You have the photo op afterward. He comes out of those meetings, and a bunch of them go endorse Donald Trump. He comes away, I think, with one endorsement with a congresswoman who he had appointed right. secretary of state and certainly owed him a right. favor. Um, but he's just so far anyway, he's not even in the race, doesn't appear to be very good at this. Yeah, it, it's been amateur hour so far. I mean, he, he, as you say, he went to D.C., he, he snuck in a back door, one wave to a camera, met with some lawmakers. Short time later, one of those lawmakers stepped outside and endorsed Donald Trump. Uh, I mean, that, you know, and, and Trump then proceeded to unveil several other endorsements from Florida members of the Florida delegation, the state that, of course, DeSantis and Trump both share. It, it, it's politics one-on-one. It's basic blocking and tackling, and, and Trump is winning so far. And, 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 Jim, also there's the questions about what DeSantis's priorities are. It's not just picking a fight with Mickey Mouse in Disney World, the happiest place on earth. That's the <laughs> slogan. Uh, and he's losing that fight. But also, he's been on this national book tour and ignored problems in his backyard. There's been major flooding in Fort Lauderdale. There's a gas shortage right now in South Florida, and he is nowhere to be found. Oh, he's an opposition researcher's best dream, right? He's letting all these things go. And what is he doing at home? He's passing a six-week abortion ban that will make him death in a general election. And, and, and running around the country trying to be a presidential campaign while his state is falling apart. It's, it's just basic block and tackling of a presidential campaign. You have to have these things lined up. You have to make sure you take care of home first. George Bush was the best example of that. Texas was locked for him, and he understood how to make it a national laboratory and how to move his message. DeSantis has no idea what he's doing, and he's surrounding himself with people who don't either. And you know this, retail politics matters in a presidential race. You have to get in these rooms and persuade very tough people who are convinced they're way smarter than you are that they should support you for president of the United States. And he's been unable to do that in places like his home state where it should be a layup. And Joe, let's remember why Governor DeSantis is going to the mat against Disney, the largest private employer in the state of Florida, the largest taxpayer in the state of Florida, the reason tourism existed in the first place and continues to exist in the state of Florida. It's because he was offended that the former CEO criticized the bill that Mika was just talking about that's now been expanded through 12th grade, where you can't talk about sexual orientation or gender identity in a classroom. He was upset that the former CEO crossed him on that one issue, and now he's in this months-long fight with Mickey Mouse. You know, you you you, you got a lot of fit. You, if you're in politics, Jen Psaki, you know this so well. The ones who are great at, we'll just say, the game of of like running for office and winning. Mm. Are the ones with short memories. I remember Bill Clinton telling me a long time ago, and the fact that Bill Clinton was talking to me at that time meant that he lived it. Yeah, Bill Clinton, tells you everything. Bill Clinton said, if you're a governor or a president, or you want to be a governor or a president, there is no greater political gift than a short memory. Let it go <laughs> off your back. Don't yeah. fight every fight. This is what was Donald Trump's ultimate curse, is he could never let an insult go by. And here's Ron DeSantis picking a fight with with Florida's favorite company, Disney. It's not even a company. It's a magic kingdom with Florida's favorite baseball team because they tweeted out a tweet after Uvalde um, with cruise liners because in the middle of COVID, they wanted people to wear masks if they came on the cruise ships because they knew that's the only way people would come on the cruise ships. You know, telling small businesses what they could and couldn't do, like this, because he wanted to prove these small little points. Like, this is insanity. And I've got to believe Republicans are going, we just lost seven years in a row because of one guy that had to respond to every little tweak. Mm-hmm. And now we have another who is actually fighting the Magic Kingdom and Mickey Mouse and Bob Iger because of something that was said about a bill months ago. 
Yeah, I mean, he's proved himself to be a bit of a fragile flower, as you as you kind of alluded yeah. to there. And you can't be in presidential politics. I know that from working for multiple presidential campaigns on the on the other side of the aisle. Let's bring in White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Karine, it's good to have you back on the show. Um, so from the White House perspective, what more can be done? So uh, let me first say uh, our hearts go out to uh, the families and the victims who have been dealing with these tragic uh, gun events uh, since the last time I saw you, uh, which is really heartbreaking that we continue to have this conversation. And sadly, Mika, I don't even have answers right now. I just have questions, which is how many more kids need to die before Republicans in Congress act? How many more senseless gun violence do we need to see or have before members, members, Republican members in Congress act? We cannot throw our hands up and say nothing can be done. We need to take action. That's why you've seen the president over and over again, about a dozen times or more, put for executive action to deal with this epidemic of gun violence. And he has done more, taken more action than any other president in, its, in, their, in their first two years. And again, we need to see courage in Congress. We need Republicans to act. It is time for legislation to be put forth so that we can come up, so they can come up, and the president can sign common sense gun laws so that we can protect our kids, so that we can protect our communities, so that we can protect our churches, our grocery stores. Just think about it. Guns are the number one killer of kids. We are adults. As adults, we're supposed to be protecting our kids. And that is not happening right now. So again, I have more questions for Republicans in the House than I have answers because we have laid out what needs to happen. The president has laid out what needs to happen and they need to show courage and they need to act. Hey, Corinne, good morning. It's Jonathan. Uh, very little uh, from House Republicans on the issues of guns yesterday, but we did finally get from House Speaker McCarthy. Uh, we've got his budget in recent days and now his debt limit plan. And we wanted to get the White House reaction to what he has proposed. And can you tell us, are there any meetings scheduled right now between the president and the House Speaker as the clock ticks towards the fiscal deadline? So a couple of things I want to say, uh, Jonathan, let me just react to uh, the blueprint, the legislation that Speaker McCarthy and uh, the MAGA wing uh, of his conference, that's what we saw. They came together. He aligned himself with them and put forth a cruel proposal, a proposal that is going to devastate working American families. That's what this proposal is going to do. At the same time, it will hold America's economy hostage so that they can take a hatchet to veteran services, to Meals on Wheels, to education, to cancer research, to law enforcement. That's what they put forth uh, for the American people. Now, you're asking me about a, a potential meeting. Look, we're going to continue to take a look uh, at, this, uh, at this legislation. We're going to analyze the impacts that it will have uh, on, again, veterans services, uh, again, education, uh, cancer research. And you know what? The president, as you've heard the president say many times, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. Well, they showed us what they value. Uh, Speaker McCarthy and Mag mega Republicans showed us what they valued. And this is what the American people have to look at, right? And so we are going to continue to m make sure, we saw this in the president's budget, that we lower costs for Americans, that he is continuing to make sure that we fight, uh, fight to lower uh, the deficit. That's what he put forth in his uh, proposal. In his proposal, he's going to lower the deficit by $3 billion over uh, over. 10 years. He has showed us our value and we're going to continue to ha happy to have that conversation about the budget. But when it comes to the debt, uh, the debt limit, they need to, Speaker McCarthy needs to put a piece of legislation on the floor to deal with the debt limit, to make sure that we do not default. Something that he did three times uh, before in the last administration. Yeah, certainly his voting record speaks for itself. But with the fundamental impasse here and a disagreement as to what you guys are even negotiating, White House versus the House. House Republicans. Um, what do you say to those who are really growing alarmed at the time? Because we got an update this week uh, that there's an estimation that because of lighter than expected tax returns heading to the Treasury, the U.S. may be on the verge of default come June, not August as we thought, but come June, just maybe six or so weeks away. Again, 
I'm, uh, Jonathan, I'm going to be very clear. We have not mixed words on this. We have been clear for the past six plus more weeks, which is Speaker McCarthy needs to stop playing chicken with the full faith and credit of our nation. He needs to put forth immediately a piece of legislation so that we do not default. This happened. He, Democrats joined Republicans uh, last administration three times to get this done. The president said this on Monday as well, which is the Speaker, Speaker McCarthy will be the first speaker to threaten, to threaten a default on our nation. So this is something that is their constitutional duty to do. They can do this. They could immediately put, again, a bill on the floor for a, for, to, to avoid a, a, def, a, a default. And that is on Congress to do. Again, it is their constitutional duty to get this done. Yeah, I, I want Mickey you to look at the, what's up right now and if people are listening on the radio. Uh, it, it, what we have up is a chart that shows that the debt ceiling has been raised since 1960, 29 times under Democratic presidents, but 49 times under Republican presidents. There you go. 49 times. And so now suddenly these Republicans that broke all records for deficits and debts under Donald Trump are suddenly claiming that they really care about deficits and that it, it doesn't wash. By the way, I said this in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 about Republicans. I said, don't claim. If you're not going to fight your own Republican president, who's a big spender, breaking records every year with budget-busting uh, 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 budgets, don't do it when there's a Democrat in office. But now they're doing it, and as Kareem said... They're actually risking the full faith and credit of the United States of America. And what does that mean? Well, it means three million Americans will likely lose their jobs if there's this default. And we face the economic consequences. Three million Americans. That means if you have a 401k, on average, you're going to lose about 20 thousand dollars. Kevin McCarthy and this Republican Congress who spent like drunken socialists when Donald Trump was president, they're going to cost you twenty thousand dollars. Your mortgages, they'll cost you an additional one hundred and thirty thousand dollars most likely. And, and and borrowing. I mean whether you're borrowing for a college education or whether you're borrowing for a new car or a used car, or you're borrowing for anything, or your credit card uh, costs, gonna skyrocket. You're gonna have bigger price tags for everything you buy. This is gonna be inflation brought to you by Kevin Mark McCarthy's Republican House. Mm -hmm. And of course, the national debt. I know they don't care about this because the national debt grew by record rates under Donald Trump and the Republican Congress. But the U.S. national debt would likely increase by $850 billion, Jeez. maybe up to a trillion dollars. So the consequences of this game that they're playing right now, and it is just a game. If they had actually fought for the things I begged them to fight for when Donald Trump was president, you could actually right. take them at their word. Right. That they actually gave a damn about deficits and the debt. But they don't. They're counting on this people is a not game. remembering, yeah, I guess. But, but we remember. Uh, and the Americans will remember. Corrine, before you go, I, I want to, as the fate of Mithapristone uh, hangs in the balance, I wonder uh, what the White House is thinking and what the president is thinking are options if women lose access to this drug that they've, they've had access to and have needed for their health care for decades. So I'll say this, uh, Mika, we are going to be prepared for whatever the Supreme Court decides, and we will be ready to fight legally, have a long legal battle if that is necessary. What I can say is that we are going to continue to support FDA's uh, evidence-based approval of Mifeprestone. They are an independent agency, and let's not forget, they also oversee uh, a wider range of other prescription drugs. So this, everything's at stake right now. 
now. This is a huge fight that is in front of us at this time. And what this administration is going to continue to promise and continue to do is fight for women's reproductive rights. That is something that, that women, millions of women across the country and Americans should know that that is what the Biden-Harris administration is, is going to continue to do is fight, is fight for women's reproductive rights. All right, White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre, thank you very much for thank coming you, on the show this morning. Thank you, Joe. Thank all of these, these incidents, all of these tragedies, oh you have, you have a, a teenager with friends that go up the wrong driveway, and as they're pulling out, they get shot and the girl gets killed. You, you of course, have the terrible story out of Kansas City where a young man knocking on a door to get his younger twin brothers knocks on the wrong door. A mass shooting he, at a Sweet 16 shot. party. I you, mean, you have a mass shooting in Alabama at a Sweet 16 party uh, and, and, and a Sweet 16 party where the sheriff says he can't really finish the press conference because he's afraid he's going to break down because it, it, it's just so crushing. You have a, a, a teenager who's a cheerleader who's oh. won... Just about every award her friends say that she could win as a cheerleader, they go to the wrong car. And then as they're fleeing, they get shot. This is this gun culture is touching all, all aspects of society and daily more, life. More and more Americans are seeing their daily lives shattered by gun violence. This year, just in the first three and a half months of this year. More Americans have been killed by guns than were killed in 20 years of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Think about that. American troops in war zones for two decades in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we heard about the tolls, the terrible tolls from those wars, unforgivable tolls from those wars. And yet we let our children be slaughtered in schoolhouses. We let our, our teenagers get gunned down in driveways. We we we, we let uh, uh, church goers, parishioners get shot up in churches, in church pews, and and the pain stays with them for decades. We let worshipers in synagogues get get slain. Nigga, this. And this is what, two things. One, it's a choice that we're making yes. as a nation. This is a choice that we are making. More specifically, it is a choice that Republican legislators in state houses are making extreme, extreme positions. And people are dying because they refuse to pass basic gun safety legislation, the likes of which they passed in states like Connecticut. California, now Michigan. That's one. Two, understand if you're younger, it hasn't always been this way. I sat down and talked to President Bill Clinton a couple of days ago uh, in, in Belfast about the peace agreement there, but we had to talk about the violence at home. And I, I told him, I said, it was so, it was the tragedy of Columbine was so shocking. But back then, we thought that was a one-off. Right. Now... It was a shocking, unusual scenario. The, 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 the number of gun killings uh, have doubled, have doubled since Sandy Hook. Leading cause 10 of years death ago. in children. Now the leading cause of death in children. If I may, it's not just the mass shootings, which is horrific as it is. But a lot of Republicans will say, well, talk about mental health. Talk about mental health? Yeah. Think about all the kids in Uvalde, all the kids in the different mass shootings and school shootings in Nashville who survived and their mental health. Think about the Sweet 16 party where the girl who celebrated her 16th birthday lost her brother and watched him die. That's talking about mental health because all of these mass shootings, we had another mass shooting this past week. I'm trying to even remember where it was, where 28 were injured. Yeah. Every single one of those people traumatized by being shot and watching other people get shot dead. 
It's That's a mental health crisis. Well, and, and, and Willie Geist, I, it's so it's so interesting. I hear Republicans because they don't want to talk about guns. They don't want to talk about the 165 mass shootings so far in 2023. So they'll talk about mental health. So let's talk about mental health. Mental health funding in the United States of America is tragically low. It's tragically low. You have so many health care providers, mental health care providers, that do not get paid for doing their job. Not by the insurance companies, not through government funding. And so there's so many kids that aren't getting that sort of mental health counseling they need. So, okay, we can do two things at once. We can talk about gun safety, but we can also talk about mental health. And if they really want to talk about mental health, go ahead, pass the bill. Yeah. Double the do funding, it. triple the funding. Put in place no one disagrees. a mental health care infrastructure that actually helps children in Central Florida, that help children in Wyoming, that help children in the middle of America in rural areas that right now have no access to the type of mental health care counseling that they need. The same with inner cities, the same in the places where mental health counseling is not even, I mean, you're talking about food deserts. There's, there's mental health counseling deserts all across America. If Republicans want to talk about mental health, okay, great, talk about it and then fund it. Because right now, it's nothing but cheap talk while more and more people die. We've gotten so much better, I'd say, in the last decade, certainly in this generation, about talking about mental illness, about destigmatizing depression, anxiety, all the things that people in this country go through, and by the way, have always gone through, but kind of hid away somewhere. Now we have to start treating it like it's a serious issue that it is, and have, we have gotten better as a country, but the guns are at the center of this. There's another story, sadly, we can add to this list, out of North Carolina, where some kids were playing basketball on the street, a six-year-old girl, the ball rolls into a guy's yard. She chases the ball. This happened on Tuesday in North Carolina. And the six-year-old gets shot. A bullet grazed in her face, like, oh, get out of my yard. God. This was a guy with a criminal record, had a gun for who knows why, but he did. And she wasn't the only one who was shot, by the way. She survived and gave a television interview yesterday, this sweet little six-year-old with a scar across her cheek because she'd been shot in the face by someone because her basketball rolled out of the street where she was playing and into the yard of another person. So there's just been a list of these this week that are deeply troubling and something that needs our attention. Let's As Kareen said, they're actually risking the full faith and credit of the United States of America. And what does that mean? Well, that means 3 million Americans will likely lose their jobs if there's this default. And we face the economic consequences. 3 million Americans. That means if you have a 401k, on average, you're going to lose about $20,000. Kevin McCarthy and this Republican Congress, who spent like drunken socialists when Donald Trump was president, they're going to cost you $20,000. Your mortgages, they'll cost you an additional $130,000, most likely. And, and, and borrowing. I mean, whether you're borrowing for a college education or whether you're borrowing for a new car or a used car or you're borrowing for anything or your credit card uh, costs, going to skyrocket. You're going to have bigger price tags for everything you buy. This is going to be inflation brought to you by Kevin Mark McCarthy's Republican House. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the national debt. I know they don't care about this because the national debt grew by record rates under Donald Trump and the Republican Congress. But the U.S. national debt would likely increase by $850 billion, Jeez. maybe up to a trillion dollars. So the consequences of this game that they're playing right now, it is just a game. If they had actually fought for the things I begged them to fight for when Donald Trump was president, you could actually right. take them at their word. Right. That they actually gave a damn about deficits and the debt. 
But they don't. They're counting on this people is a not game. remembering, yeah, I guess. But, but we remember. Uh, oh. And the Americans will remember. You're writing about this this morning. Ralph Yarl, Kaylin Gill Gillis, we can add Peyton Washington, the cheerleader in Texas. What's the thread between those stories? I was so struck by the fact that these, and I focused on Kaylin and Ralph in Saratoga County, New York, Kansas City, Missouri, different places, different histories, different situations, two young people of different backgrounds, different outcomes, one lived, one died, and yet the beats of the story were the same. You, you approach someone's house and you are shot and in one case killed for driving up a driveway, knocking on a door, these basic things that people do in a free society. And what, it, what really struck me was something that a, a scholar friend of mine had told me a while ago. We were talking about actually India, where his ancestors and mine come from, and the United States. And he was talking about the hallmark of modern societies is anonymous trust. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know people to transact. You write checks to people, you go to an AA meeting, you don't know the people there, but you share your life story with them. You, I've hired babysitters from a website. In many cultures in the world, and for most of our ancestors, I think all of our great grandparents would have been shocked at the notion of just bringing in a babysitter to your house that you don't know, you don't know the family, you don't know. The, but we have built modern societies on the notion of anonymous trust. We have systems, we have institutions that allow us to, and it has allowed prosperity, it's allowed us to travel around the world, it allows so much of modern life. And it occurred to me watching these cases that we're not just dividing as a country, we're not just polarizing, we are de-developing. We are moving backwards with millions of people, their brains now addled by we were talking about Fox News, this propagandistic feeling that you are in danger, everybody's a threat. And we are going back to this kind of Game of Thrones world where a lot of our fellow citizens feel like they live in a castle and there is a moat. And if anyone crosses your moat, they need to be murdered because they could only be coming to murder you. It is a and, and, national yes. brain damage and it is deadly. And it is eroding the foundation of actually what makes this a functional, free, modern society. And it is deadly, and it is by design. I'm old enough to remember after Waco, uh, after Ruby Ridge, uh, I, uh, even Oklahoma City, I remember older Republicans well, a president of the United States, former president of the United States, uh, and other uh, longtime conservatives quitting the NRA because their rhetoric turned so radical, talking about federal agents, law enforcement officers, the NRA, calling them jack-booted thugs for fundraising purposes because they realized they could fundraise and make more money if they could plant in the minds of Americans that the government was coming to get you, that they were coming to get your guns. I heard it when I was knocking on doors. I wasn't as widespread as, as it is now, but when I was running, you would hear that sort of people talked about militias. They talked about the black helicopters. We all laughed that off, but the NRA kept picking up the scab year after year after year. And when I talk about this hyper individualism that has taken shape in America and that lack of trust, that lack of community that binds societies together, this didn't just happen because this happened as a direct result of a strategy by groups like the NRA and people like Glenn Beck and, and others that would get on television and tell people every day that the government is coming to get you. Not just like the Ronald Reagan, the scariest words are, I'm the wrong government and I'm coming, you know, I'm here to help you. Ha ha ha. And everybody else. No, that morphed into the federal government is coming to get you. We talk about Fox News. They have told their viewers over the past six months 
that proud Marines and and members of the army uh, are coming to the United States in the same helicopters that they used in Afghanistan to kill people who voted for Donald Trump, that law enforcement officers were coming to kick down their doors from the same agencies that Donald Trump says we have to defund them and that they're coming to kill them. You have Republican senators now picking up on this. The oldest Republican senator saying IRS agents, IRS agents are coming to Iowa and they're going to kick in their doors and kill middle class Americans. This has been a deliberate plan for 25 years. And we ask why all of this is happening? Well, everybody's brandishing guns? Well, everybody's shooting at everybody? We know the answer. And yeah. it is not by accident. And it is a choice, Anna. It's what I keep telling our viewers. This is a choice that people are making. It is a choice. It is a project. I think, frankly, some of the language that we were using after 9-11 to describe radicalization around the world applies very much here at home. Uh, there has been a project, a funnel of radicalization for lots of these people in the way you describe, and, and the end goal is to sell guns. Uh, and, and I just to make it personal for a second, you know, my, my parents uh, came to this country in the late 1970s from India, and they moved to Shaker Heights, Ohio. And many things were culturally good culture shock. But one of them was like people said hi to you on the street. You don't have to know them to say hi to you. In India, no one says hi to you on the street if they don't know you. People left their doors open. My parents didn't leave their doors open, but everybody else left their doors open, <laughs> right? What these yeah. folks at Fox News and elsewhere are doing is, and the NRA, not just trying to sell guns, not just trying to sell ads on their networks, but they are trying to destroy some of the best things about American culture. Immigrants I know who come to this country, the thing that most strikes them is that high level of anonymous trust. People's basic sense that people in their neighborhood are decent people. And Fox News is taking a jackhammer to the fabric of American culture to make money.